Hello and welcome to the Global Press Conference for Fantastic Beasts, The Secrets of Dumbledore. On the count of three, how are you guys feeling? Good. Great. Great. Yeah, great, cool, yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Mm. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here and I know it's the first time that you've come together as a collective to discuss your film. So I'm really excited to get started. Thank you everyone for joining us. We've got all your questions. We're gonna get into them. First things first though, I have to introduce the lovely people who are sitting on the stage. Uh, my new favorite people, by the way. We've got producers, Tim Lewis and David Heyman and director David Yates. We have got William Nadiam, Victoria Yates, Alison Sudol, Jessica Williams, Dan Fogler, Mads Mickelson, Eddie Redmayne, and Jude Law. What about this yes. one here? What about her? I know, I know, yeah. yeah definitely. That's like, I, nice. did. I love that though. I, I did. Love that. Always looking at me. I love that. Thank I, you. I didn't hear That's her. nice. Uh, she's I, did. Cold. I rattled through it. I was nervous, That's you see. Classic Jacob Queenie energy. <laughs> <laughs> but you're always sticking out for us, so I love that. Um, I thought we'd start with some pre pre done questions which uh should be quite cute starting with you jude if that's okay oh lord oh <laughs> lord here we go uh so albus dumbledore has been with us from the start of the wizarding world which launched 20 years ago in this film how has he changed and which of his qualities do you think are consistent with the albus, albus that we know and love mm. So it's not a process of change, it's more a process of regression, mm. I suppose. And, and one, of the, uh, one of the joys that David really allowed me to investigate was rather than feeling the, the weight of the brilliant performances uh, by Michael Gambon and Richard Harris was to really go back and, and understand that he's not the fully formed Dumbledore of the Harry Potter books and films. He's a man still finding his way, still confronting and resolving his demons. And, uh, and that's what I mean by regression, I suppose, that in this film in particular, he's facing the past, he's um, facing himself and his own guilt. But if there were a quality uh, that links him, I would say it's his mischievousness, his humor, and his belief in people, his belief, he sees the positive, you think, how Dumbledore believed in Draco he believed even in Tom Riddle um you know he he sees the good or the potential good and I think that's something that he's always had what appealed to you about diving into this character's history I mean what <laughs> it was a kind of no-brainer it um you know would you like to play Albus Dumbledore yes <laughs> I would uh I felt like I'd been in preparation subconsciously from the minute I started reading the books to my children. Um, and gosh, where, where it, there's just so much in the character to mine and to investigate as an actor. And that's before you even get into this extraordinary world of magic. That's just him as a, as a human. Um, but the magic's really fun too. Uh, I remember Eddie telling me that uh, uh, on the second film, the first film for me, where he talked about, you know, if there's a situation or a problem with a scene, or, you know, you, you remember you've got magic at your disposal. And the scene uh, in Berlin, when I had to basically pass on information to the, the team, went from being a scene where I was basically passing over maps to a scene with a magic hat and all sorts of things flying out. And that, again, that was the excuse of, well, yeah, it's magic, so I can do that. <laughs> Eddie, it seems that in this film, Dumbledore is treating Newt more like an equal, mm. giving him a position of leadership within, within the team that, that he assembles. Can you talk about their relationship and how it's evolved and what it's been like working with Jude on his second film? Um, I love the Newt Dumbledore relationship. Uh, it's, for me, what I love is that it's got that complexity of sort of master and apprentice, but, if, but it's evolved throughout the movies to being something almost fraternal, I would say, in this one, a sort of older brother, younger brother. And there's a moment in this film where, for, where, where Newt even takes it upon himself, sees the vulnerability in Dumbledore and, and, and tries to um, pass on a moment of wisdom <laughs> to, to him. So that progression, but what I, what I love about Newt is fundamentally he's an, an introverted guy and is most comfortable with his creatures and in his own world. Um, but Dumbledore has seen a quality in him 
that is has the potential for leadership, albeit in an unconventional way. And, and this film, what I love about this movie, it's like a wizarding heist movie in which this group of outsiders all band together with an, uh, all of us are unconventional, all of us, and the leader is unconventional. And that's, there's a kind of wonder in that. As far as working with Jude's concerned, I adore this man. Uh, he was a, a friend before we started working together. And one of the real joys about working on a series of films is you get to push things. You get to um, feel so comfortable working with each other that you can you can kind of push boundaries, I suppose. And um, and also there's a kind of shorthand. So that was kind of joyful in this. Well, you spoke about this being a band of outsiders. Speaking of outsiders, Dan. <laughs> Hi. I, I, I thought you were going to go that way and this way and come back. You're back in the room, buddy. Okay, I'm here. So, I'm, uh, yeah, yeah. When we first see Jacob in this film, it's clear that he and his bakery have fallen on hard times. Can you talk about where he is at the start of this movie? Yeah, he he kind of reflects the times uh, in a lot of ways. He's It's like we're heading into the Great Depression and he's extremely <laughs> down on his luck and it seems like he's just in this constant state of loss, like he's lost. He's lost his love, he's lost his appetite, he's losing his bakery, it's like, He's like losing his mind, you know, and um, and so that's where you see him. He's he's very he's just you know very sad when you first see him, and then um, but he still holds that you know glimmer of hope that Queenie's going to come back. He's you know hallucinating, and and um, and then then Lally comes and offers offers him a chance to to come back and and join the adventure again, and. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, and he does it all for, for his love. That's his whole motivation. Well, Jessica, we do meet Lally briefly in the second movie, but in the secrets of Dumbledore, she is a central character. Tell us a little bit more, uh, more about her. Yeah, uh, Professor Yalali Hicks uh, is a charms professor at Ilvermorny, the North American Wizarding School. Um, she is a brilliant uh, witch who I think is a good teacher, and I think she went to school with Queenie and with Tina uh, at the same time. And um, I think that she's someone who's really good at seeing uh, into the heart of people and, and the heart of the matter. And I think. Uh, not only that, but she's really good at defensive magic. And I think Dumbledore, you know, kind of recruits her to help her, you know, deal with his bad ex. And I really feel like this is a good person to call for something like that. And uh, I think that she is someone who in this situation trusts Dumbledore, you know, even though she doesn't necessarily know how things are going to play out. Because again, she kind of sees the heart of people. Mads. You are new to yeah. Wizarding World. Congratulations on the new job. Thank you. It's going smashingly. Thanks. Um, you portray one of the most powerful dark wizards. One of them? One of. <laughs> one of. Of his age, of his time. All right, I got you. I'll give you it in that decade. Let's do that. Girl at Grindelwald. Um, what was it like for you to enter this world and how did you approach the character? Yeah, I was, uh, I was thrown into it a little later than, than the rest of the gang. I mean, they've done two films and then they were halfway through when I joined the party. Yeah, it's like, um, it's, it's, a, it's a family you visit and you just can only hope that they will uh, adopt you. Uh, and they did. Everybody is just, they all, the whole gang is fantastic. The crew is fantastic. David is fantastic. And if, if they're the family, he's the godfather and he's done this so many times so he makes everybody feel at home, right? So my, um, my, uh, my journey was fast and swift, but I felt at home right away. You've played many villains in, yeah. in your career. Misunderstood. Good people, uh, <laughs> yeah, you've played many, many complex characters yeah. who just, they just sway just part, just left of the good line. Yeah. Um, how did you take that journey to understanding Grindelwald? World? How did you find the balance between his menacing behavior, but also his charm? Yeah, I mean, it's not something I find myself. It's in the story and then it's, it's in David's head. And then it was also through, for, for this character, he's very, very uh, linked to, to Dumbledore. And, and for me and Jude, we had quite a few conversations about what that relationship looked like. So, so my character is shaped out of that world. Um, 
But I mean, you 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 don't start out saying uh, you know, nobody actually in history started out saying you know I, I'm going to be the bad guy, right? So we have to figure out what his mission is, what's his goal, why is he trying to make the world a better place in that matter, you know? Uh, so um, I think that they started out having a a common and a mutual goal as as young adults or or, or big children, uh, and then it got blurry. The ways of, of getting to that goal were different than they imagined. Alison, everything about Queenie has changed from when we first met her. Can you share a little bit without giving it away too much about her present circumstance? It's difficult, isn't it? I can say so little. <laughs> um, but um, so at the, at the end of the second film, we see Queenie make a pretty shocking decision, something that no one really expected. But if you follow through the film and you really think about it, she was sort of in one unfortunate circumstance after another because of the way that the wizarding world operates and the prejudice. And and really all she wants to do is just be with the person she loves. And the narrow-mindedness of the world she lives in puts her into a really vulnerable position where somebody that's really manipulative can tell her what she wants to hear and that's you know th that's going to have an impact so um at the start of this film we find her in a world that is very different than any world she's ever been in before um she's also being utilized for this tremendous power that she has um that she's either had to hide in the past or she's been made to feel guilty about and there is something uh, interesting about that about about a person who hasn't actually been able to live fully as who they are um, and I think a lot of young women can relate to that as well of of what happens when somebody sees that thing in you that burning part of you that nobody else sees um, and so she's in a sort of it's a, it's an it's a tricky interesting position we don't really know where she's going to go and who she is and how she's going to move forward because she's at a point in her life where she has sort of two ways to go but she's made a decision that uh you can't really just say to Gellert Grindelwald you know I'm sorry I actually <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is pretty this is pretty creepy you know so it, maybe maybe she won't be able to to get away or maybe she will that's what that's what her journey is now you did well then to not give anything away I think that's really well done. hard well <laughs> done <laughs> Uh, William, a, a lot happened with your character in the previous story. Without giving too much away, again, uh, can you talk a little bit about Yusuf and where we find him in this film? Well, um, yeah, a lot happens to, 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 to Yusuf. People seem to want to take things uh, out of him, you know, whether it's uh, Newt trying to take things out of his eye or... <laughs> Grunenwald trying to extract things from his head. I don't know what is with the message there, but still, we'll talk about this again. Um, Yusuf is someone who, um, who is uh, motivated by pain and vengeance. And that's a recurring theme, in fact. And what I love about the writing and what we're, what we're doing is talking about humanity, talking about what what motivates us, what, what are the subtleties that, that, that makes us. And um, so he has been pursuing a vengeance, looking for the person who created the demise of this family and realized that he was chasing the wrong target. And, but fortunately enough, he finds his sister. Oh, great, my sister. Oh, shit. Uh, <laughs> she dies. <laughs> She's burned right under my eyes. So this is Yusuf Kama. He's, uh, you know, he doesn't have a very good karma, this Kama. And um, so when we find him again, something beautiful happens to him. First, uh, he's less skinny, so he's, he's been fed since. But um, Dumbledore has provided him with a mission. Uh, he's been uh, given a mission. He's part of an army, and he's been provided for the person who had lost everything. He's been provided with one of the most beautiful gifts, a family a family led by Newt, and a purpose. So you have to f watch the film to know what happens then. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, Victoria, all the way over there. Hello. Hello, darling. Um, 
Bunty has always played a key role in Newt's world, but in this film, this time around, she really steps out of the shadows. Again, without giving too much away, common theme of this press conference. Uh, where do we find her in, in this film? What's her circumstance? She's just given a more important role. Um, she grows in confidence. Um, she would do anything for her beloved Newt. <laughs> anything um but you just see her step out of the shadows more and dumbledore gives her a mission which will be very important to the film <laughs> without giving too much away <laughs> um ultimately what are bunty's feelings for new and and why do you think that the message is, isn't getting through mm, um why isn't the message getting through? Because she's obsessed, I suppose. Um, no, she she idolizes him. She has watched him, you know, for most of her life growing up in Hogwarts, seeing this, you know, she loves beasts and she's happier in the basement with beasts. And she wants to be like him, be as good as him. And so there's a lot of different levels of love, I think, a lot of um, respect and you know it happens doesn't it unrequited love <laughs> i mean you know it has been eight years but um i hope she'll get there um <laughs> i hope she'll branch out at some point but you know um you just she just needs more time than other people to branch out she's happy she's happy <laughs> she's happy in, in his shadow oh yeah uh, david <laughs> We recently celebrated the 20th anniversary of the Wizarding World, and you have been, I think it's an understatement to say, a major part of um, its cinema history. What have you loved about continuing this journey through seven films, and what do you think is the enduring appeal of the Wizarding World? You, you know, I think you can see it here on the stage this afternoon, the fact that these stories bring such a collective together to work on them. And there's something really beautiful and enjoyable about working with the people around me, which is a great pleasure. When you make a movie, it's a huge logistical enterprise and it's tough and creatively, logistically, technically. And so going into that experience with people you respect and admire, but who also can take the strain of it with some real dignity and some real humor is essential. And, and that's the qualities I've found in many of the people I work with in front of the camera and behind the camera. So if I look back over those seven films, it's a very fond memory of the many wonderfully creative people I've worked with across all of them. And that sense of family, we use that word quite a bit, but it's important because that doesn't always happen in our industry because it's a tough business. And when we come together to make something, it's always, I think, more interesting than working apart, making something, so to speak. Um, and I think what's enduring about these movies, I, I think they just, they, they, they become a safe place to go to for lots of people. They celebrate certain values, loyalty, love, friendship, um, empowering the outsider, the person you always underestimate, things that, you know, resonate for a lot of people out in the real world. And, and they do it in this magical space. So I think it's sort of, we're, we're sort of, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful thing to be part of stories that create a, a safe space for some people when they, when they go into the movie theater to watch them, you know, and, and um, I'm very proud of that. that you know, for both, you know, beloved and, and, and new characters, how is this a return to the magic of the wizarding world? Because, you know, it's taken the audiences, I think, to say on a ride. So how, how have you found this return? Um, well, you know, with this movie in particular, um, our previous um, episode was, it was quite complicated plot-wise for all of us. <laughs> and it took us a while to figure that one out. And that, so with this story in particular, we wanted it not only to be emotional, but we wanted it to be enjoyable and for it to be a real treat and for it to lean into the values of some of the earlier Potter films that had whimsy and charm humor and humanity we showed it to a, a little audience a few weeks ago and there was this very young man in the audience i won't name him but he was a very young he was a kid 
And uh, everyone turned to him when the lights went up and said, what do you think? You know, because he's one of our first audience members, other than the people here who have seen it. And he looked at me and he said, I liked it. It's really human. And I thought, we'll take that. We've made a film with all this extraordinary stuff in it. And the one thing he takes away from it, it's really human. And that's a testament to the performances and the story and everything. It's really human. Let's have that in the world we're living in at the moment. Um, yeah. Tim, this film returns to some of the places that audiences love, but it also takes them to brand spanking new places as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I think, I mean, one of the exciting things certainly for the audience and certainly for us filmmakers, is being able to open up the magical world and to go to completely new areas, um, which gave us hugely interesting, creative, new environments to reproduce. Um, I mean, I'm not sure which countries I'm allowed to say, but we start off in China, uh, in, in the forest, and that's a very different area for us to go to. Um, uh, we then spend quite a lot of time in Germany. We see the German Ministry of Magic, which we've obviously in the past seen New York, we've seen the UK, it, and it's nice to open up and just see a completely new um, ministry. Um, and then at the end, we end up in Bhutan. Uh, again, a completely new, different area. And then we do go back, as you said, to familiar places. We go back to Hogwarts uh, quite a lot, and we go back to Hog Hogsmeade. Um, and I think that for us as who've been on this journey for a while is exciting to go back and see those places again um, and um, be familiar with those places that, from all the, the previous films. We are about to open up to uh, the questions from the territories. Before we go there, actually, uh, David, I did want to ask you about the big themes of I wanted to ask about the big themes of this film. We've spoken about friendship, about loyalty. Are there any others we have to look out for? Gosh, there are so many themes that resonate throughout Joe's work and uh, in this film. It's about family, the family you make, as opposed to necessarily the family you're born into. It's about the courage of doing the right thing. It's about love. It's about learn about sacrifice ultimately it's a, you know for dumbledore it's about choosing between the love he had and maybe still has and doing the right thing for the greater good he and grindelwald have two different views um, and it's about the choices which again is something that really permeates all of joe's work it's about the choices you make and um, it's for, for, for newt for Dumbledore, for all the characters, it's about making the right choices for them. So now we're going to open it up to uh, press questions, and this is, these are from Germany. Uh, a question for the cast, so I'll start with uh, you, Eddie, if that's all right. Did every one of the actors know the whole story before filming started? Did you know the whole story before filming started? You, so we get um, given the, the script, so we know the whole story of the script, but as far as the, the story of the arc of the series, um, it was sort of each script at a time. Occasionally we would get snippets of what, what might be coming up in the next films, and you would always, there would be a, quite a lot of Chinese whispers of people sort of, did you hear that this might be, we might be going to, um, so lots of sort of rumors would find themselves, um, sometimes they would materialize, often maybe like, well, I thought we were going to. Um, but, uh, so, but we did have um, the script, but also one of the amazing things about David Yates, our director, is that, even though the script is there and it's and you would and it's incredibly the the the, cre the technical creating of that script is 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 a is a big technical feat he would allow us as actors the freedoms to improvise to come up with new ideas to change things or modulate things on the day and so as Jude says, one often does that in, on, on film sets, but when you get to incorporate magic into that as well, or, or creatures and getting to say, well, what if the creatures did this and we had a, um, we could play with that. And that, 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 that for me is, has been some of the most 
fun and and you know a lot of these actors here i'm useless at improvising but they're brilliant at it and so watching dan or you know jessica improvise and add just extra layers um uh, have, was was really wonderful this question's from argentina and i think any of you who had an overwhelming feeling uh, are qualified to answer this one. How did it feel to step into the Great Hall, that iconic place from the Harry Potter films? Oh yeah, I got I got chills. Uh, <laughs> that was one of those moments where I was just like, uh, I started reading those books in the third grade, and a lot of the books hadn't come out yet, and so so I grew up knowing it just for more more time than I've been alive, and to be you know just in the great hall and seeing i think that was amazing and then seeing the kids in their robes their wizarding uniforms actually was like the most like i could cry like i wanted to you know the sensation of wanting to squeeze something cute i wanted to squeeze a lot of the kids and just shake them which means that it was cute um and it i i just got i was like i want to squeeze a kid um and so i just but then i realized i was an actor as a liability as a lot of you know um so i didn't squeeze the kids but the sensation was there and basically i i got chills and there was a lot of times where i had to go back and forth uh in this movie between just totally nerding out and just being like i cannot believe i'm here could i tell myself in the third grade that one day i would get to play this witch i i wouldn't even have believed it back then um and then the other part was like oh right i need to know my lines and make sure because i'm accountable to to this big big production that i got in in you know inserted in um, but it was totally a, a pinch me moment and it was really surreal. And, and the kids in the robes really just, it just took me back to Sorcerer's Stone vibes or Philosopher's Stone vibes, if you will, since we're in the UK. Everyone looked to you a bit like, no, it's Philosopher's, babes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm gonna direct this at you, David Yates. This is a question from Bolivia. Who is the funniest person in the cast in real life? Oh, that's a really good question. Yeah. Oh my God. Um, I know. <laughs> looking around. I know. It's me. <laughs> I was going to say it was Eddie. Um, <laughs> actually, you know who's got the driest? I mean, they're all pretty funny. I have to say that, obviously. Um, I think Mads is quite funny. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I think Mads has got. I, I wasn't trying to. I was trying to be yeah. terrifying. He got a really right, dry, enough. insightful, perceptive. He's funny. I'll take it. Thanks. <laughs> Is that good? <laughs> mean but funny. Mean but funny. Ezra is remarkably funny as well. Uh, he has this uh, ability that he, he's, he's a top serious actor. He goes into this zone, he disappears somewhere, and he's still with us in the room. But then when you say cut, he's out of it and he cracks a joke. It's just amazing uh, ability. I would never have guessed that. Yeah. Um, this is from Multiple Markets. I'll aim it at you, Dan. Which of the Fantastic Beasts would you like to bring from the movie into the real world? The Demi guys. <laughs> really? Yeah. Mish, love it. Because why? Because he could. He can tell. Why? The, tell the future. You can take him to the track. <laughs> and give you lottery numbers. <laughs> okay. I think, you know what I'm saying? You can, uh, I get the juice. <laughs> Take him to Vegas. <laughs> you make a lot of money it's with also that. It's kind of really sweet in a very specific way. Yeah, you can like I hang out. Thinking about how sweet they are. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah, get a handbag to carry all the cash you win. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you can get the Niffler doing that stuff. You can make Niffler a fortune with everything. And no, you train him and make sure that he come over here. Sit down. Hand over hand. Over. Just, uh, they like leave <laughs> such a mess. I can and train a Niffler. I can yeah, train a Niffler. No. Do you? Does anyone have a favorite beast? The chillin. Yeah, the niffler. The chillin. The owl girl. The chillin. I'm kind of oh, a classic the owl person. Oh. I'm an owl. Love the chillin. Jude you will all love the pick. chillin. Oh, he's great adoration picket. I I also adore picket, but have a, and I love that in this movie picket and the sweet and incredibly complicated niffler Teddy. They, they join forces yeah. and 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 you realize that they're kind of like the siblings that have had a consistent rivalry either in my coat pocket or down in our case <laughs> and here they cut their they're forced to step up and they do, they do. spoiler alert the, the way in which those 
characters have evolved is kind of nothing short of fascinating, really, because even in the script, they're, they're detailed descriptions, but they're completely imagined characters. And like Eddie said, in this film, suddenly they're, they're kind of saving the day and they're doing stuff, I mean, genuinely for us, you know, to sit and watch and go, hold on, this whole scene's about Teddy. Yeah. What's he doing? <laughs> He's brilliant. He's awesome, you know. <laughs> The HBO He's Max brilliant. series coming soon. <laughs> Teddy and Pickett, I'm watching. <laughs> so we've got a question uh, from Mexico here. Alison, I'll, I'll aim it at you. Um, which one is your favourite spell from all of the Wizard and World movies? So not just from The Secrets of Dumbledore. You've got the, a plethora of, of films to choose from. That is a big question. I'm glad I'm not answering it. Favourite spell? Oh, God. Uh, Avada could no, I'm joking. But, um, <laughs> I have I have one recently. Help. The, the Tanta Allegra one. Do you know what that is? No. That's to make people dance. <gasps> like it makes. Oh. Yes. Dance. Just like, and I just thought give that would a, be genius. Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, uh, but, so if we, if we just because went I can't Allegra. dance, I yes. can make yes, myself. Yes, you can <laughs> dance. And also just random. I think in life, randomly to to make yourself feel better, would just be like making people randomly dance on the tube would be quite fun. Yeah. I like I I like the burrow in general, and like I feel like. Molly Weasley just has a lot of good house practical. Yeah. I would, I would, That's I would so raid nice. her spell cabinet. Totally. I would absolutely. Yeah. Just, I, I just, is there one that, for just nappies? Yeah, like, like nappy oh. <laughs> to just make them disappear and dishes. Yes, all That's of that. So, like, so practical and yeah. boring, but yeah. really a nappy useful. spell, yeah. a nap spell, a nap dish spell. spell. Yes, uh, to make it. Yes. Yeah. Vicky and I have small children, yeah. small babies. <laughs> so that's all we can think about. Not like, not, not, nothing, you know, big and beautiful. Just like, can practical. you just get rid of the nappies? <laughs> no, it's very practical. It's very practical. Can you make my child sleep? Uh, we're going to multiple markets now, and this one is for you, Jude. Uh, Dumbledore was also portrayed by Richard Harris and Michael Gambon in the Harry Potter films, like you uh, mentioned before. What was the major lure of the character to you? And did you have to watch those earlier films again to sort of synchronize your portrayal of this much loved wizard uh, to theirs? The major lure was just the opportunity to, to fill in gaps and go back and um, explore themes and sides of his character that were hinted at in the books and suggested in the films and what have you. Um, yeah, any excuse to go back and watch. Uh, I, I mean, I took, I was probably caught watching, watching them over and over saying, I'm doing research, <laughs> I'm, I'm studying. But uh, I think, like I said, honestly, it was kind of important to, I, we felt to free ourselves from the Dumbledore we knew because he wasn't quite that man yet. Uh, but at the same time, there were definite uh, qualities that both Richard Harris and Michael Gammon gave the character that I wanted to uh, I was, I steal, I suppose. Um, the sort of humor uh, and um, the relish of life uh, and uh, impish behavior. Um, but both of them have a sort of a gravitas, a sort of soulness, a soulfulness that I thought was really beautiful and complicated. Uh, this film delves right into the relationship between Dumbledore and Grindelwald as well. Um, it explores what brought them together, what tore them apart. Could you talk us through a little bit about their relationship and how you and Mads also work to establish that rapport on screen? Yeah. I mean, a lot of it was just sharing our pers perspective or our, our imagined take on how they met and, uh, and what that meant to them. And to me, it was always really important to think of who Albus was before he met Gellert. And I always imagined that being Dumbledore was actually quite a lonely place, being that he was brilliant and outstanding at a very young age to the point where he probably felt slightly isolated or someone who was maybe re uh, diminishing his own sense of power and self and scope and ambition and then suddenly he meets someone who is uh, as brilliant and uh, matches him and inspires him and uh, uh, and that kind of connection is very 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 powerful more so when you're at a very you know uh, a young age and um, I think it's important then to also remember 
what their time together would have been like, incredibly dynamic, incredibly uh, uh, cherished and special. And then um, this awful kind of moment where you realize you're on a different path, you're actually moving away from each other, but that doesn't necessarily take away from the explosive kernel, the, 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 uh, the firework that went off initially. In fact, it makes it harder. Um, but, you know, we, we, I, I said this earlier, we, it, felt, it felt very fortuitous being able to play this character at the age I'm at now, because it was wonderful being able to reflect at my age, you know, 25 years back and sort of think, mm, who am the person I've become? Are there mistakes I've made? And being able to still sit easy with that, but nonetheless still feel how uh, alive it is in you. And really to prepare, we just talked an awful lot about all of those areas. And of course, at some point, his opinion differed from mine because our characters. Uh, uh, yours is differing from mine. <laughs> <clears throat> That's how I remember. <clears throat> right. But I think also, you, uh, oh, sorry, you, Eddie, uh, said it right that, that yes, the, we have to remember there's magic here. If you add the magic, then, then a lot of things happens to us as characters as well. But also, it goes the other way. We wanted this to be real. We wanted to, the magic we take for granted. It's been with us since we were born. We can't be wearing the fanboy hat and go, oh my God, this is, this is magic, right? So we wanted that relationship to be real, real people real situation, real disappointment with each other. And then we are wearing a hat that is magical, but we kind of tend to forget it in some of these scenes. Oh man, it's like I haven't seen the film and I just want to watch it again. <laughs> uh, this is from Portugal and for you, Eddie. Uh, how many takes were necessary to get that incredible sequence? Because you just lied right now on this very stage saying you can't dance. The imaginary crabs swivel, but delicately. <laughs> we saw your footwork. We saw it. There, there's, there's a sort of, I don't know. I, it all stems from the erumpent mating dance in the first movie. And clearly is, something in that tickled David and Joe and Steve. And basically in each film there is another <laughs> iteration which basically is written intricately in detail and character and it's basically that eddie makes a tool of himself <laughs> a scene um but of course we took it incredibly seriously and we spent a long time david and i and alex reynolds the movement director i work with talking about oh and how could this be and let's look at real wildlife programs and see how you we did all that and then um and then we did some very embarrassing outtakes, which probably exist, of me sending videos to David going, how about this? You know, sort of really intense dance things. And then eventually it was, how about I just wiggle and put my hands in the air? Is that a bit? And the other thing was there was this, at the same time, the special effects department were coming up with ideas of what the creatures might be. And so it ended up being, I'd love to say a marriage, but it was more a sort of car crash collision of two ridiculousnesses that met together the weird thing is it was bloody exhausting like and david would have me coming down like the whole prison like this and by the time i got to the lines <laughs> and also i had to hold this lantern do you remember david i had to hold the lantern which was weirdly heavy because it was the entire way that i was lighting this huge cave was with this lantern and i got to the bottom and i'd be like and there was a physio on set who was having to massage my shoulder between takes in order that I'd be able to do it the next day. Anyway, that's enough about that. It was quite, it was quite, but it was, it made it all worth it when Callum had to have a go. Um, because, uh, yeah. This is a question uh, from the USA uh, for you, Eddie. Uh, have you learned anything personally from your time playing Newt Scamander in the Fantastic Beast series? Because he seems to have matured and grown a lot over the films. Oh, I, that's a lovely question, actually. I adore Newt and um, there are many things that I love about him. I love his, um, that he's an incredibly empathetic person. He looks for the good in people. Um, he, I, I, he's also very happy in his own company and um, in the company of creatures. He's someone that enjoys um, silence. I'm someone that uh, in, in my anxiety tend to fill 
uh, as I'm doing now, uh, too, too many words. And, and I've tried to, so, but along with that, there are various sort of epithets or, or things that he said, which I now try and live by. One is that worrying means you suffer twice, which was in the first movie, that I, I'm a great warrior. And I, keep, I always tell myself, like, if, if the, the horrendous thing is going to happen, there's no point worrying about it because it's going to happen anyway. And then you know, it's just going to have doubled your pain. Um, and there's something that he says to Dumbledore in this piece, which I adore, which is that, and I'm butchering it here, but we can all, we all make mistakes in life, but you can try and make things better. And it's the trying that counts. It's the aspiring to make things better that counts. And sometimes you go, oh, I've really screwed that up. Oh, I'm just gonna hide away in my hovel and, and put up the, the, um, the sort of exoskeleton. And I love that, that actually the way he thinks it's all about trying to make things better. And uh, this question's from Mexico. Uh, all the Harry Potter fans, Eddie, have been waiting for the moment that your character returns to Hogwarts. How was it for you to film that moment? It's pretty amazing. I've got to say, one of our first, one of our first scenes, it, was, it wasn't actually Hogwarts, but it was in um, the Hog's Head. And it was a group of us, and he wasn't there, sadly, um, but a group of us, and we got to sit there and drink butterbeer next to a roaring fire with this group of actors who I adore. And, um, and it felt like, it, it, I had to pinch myself going, this, we, this is our job. Um, and it, it, it was really remarkable. And, and as these guys said earlier, walking into the great hall was, and watching Dan interact with the little ones, amazing. Dan? We're back on you, buddy. Uh, this is from Germany. Food was delicious. <laughs> <laughs> How was the food? It was wonderful. Um, Scrambled eggs were. A muggle being given a wand is something that you do not see every day. Ever, ever, ever. Can you talk us through how you felt playing Jacob's emotions when he received it? It was a huge moment. Yeah. Um, I, I, I watched for two movies, everyone get a wand and they go and they, they go to their training sessions and they, <laughs> and, uh, and I, I always was wondering like, well, maybe one day they'll let me like, maybe one, someone will drop one and I'll be able to like pick it up and give it back to them or something. Um, and just to be, I felt like it was just an enormous honor to be handed this wand from Dumbledore, I mean, through Newt from Dumbledore. Um, and I just thought, man, there's a lot of potential for some great um, comedy and action moments, which are in the film, uh, with this muggle just trying to, you know, have thing work, you know, like just trying to figure it out. And, and, um, and it was just great uh, just having it, holding it, putting it in my pocket. Um, if you see Jacob, he was not given any training, so he just kind of, he like holds it like a, he holds it like how a soldier would hold a gun or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was just so cool. I, I felt like I was, you know, you know, it's like being in a Western and not having a gun, you know, was, suddenly I was, or being in Star Wars, not having a lightsaber, like I was handed a lightsaber. You know, for me, that's huge. How do you feel that your character has evolved since the last movie? Okay, so he's kind of, he, I love Jacob's arc. I love how he keeps on trying to get out, but they keep pulling him back in. And, um, and I, love, uh, I love how um, their relationship is, it's like how a relationship, you know, might go, you know, or you, you, you fall in love and it's, you know, you know, really fun and exciting at first, but then, you know, after you get to know each other, you know, maybe, uh, and then maybe, um, what are you saying? What are you saying? No, I'm saying for you, uh -huh. you got to know uh -huh. me and you were like, you know what? Yeah. Is that how it went? The grass is always green. Really? <laughs> that's, that's, that's your, that's the story, is it? Well, you know, I'm trying to make it make mm -hmm. sense in my 
Okay. My mind. You're yep. in but trouble. I, I am. I don't even. I thought I was. I thought everything was cool. <laughs> sure. Whereas you okay. won't know. Yeah. yeah. I, don't, I, yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Hey, we're all muggles mm. deep down. So are we? We all literally are muggles deep down here. <laughs> um, everyone here is a muggle. Uh. But, uh, <laughs> um, but you know, I, I think that, um, yeah, for for him, um, for Jacob, the most important thing is Queenie. And, um, yeah, he's, I, I love how their relationship, you know, makes for a good story. To, it, it can't always be love and roses you know you have some tension there she comes she gets pulled away and it's uh, it's that's a huge part of the adventure is getting her back and um, that question was from the usa market and this one is our final one we've actually run out of time which is mad because i feel like it's going really quickly but you know having fun and all that uh this is from finland and it's from uh for allison and dan as well uh in the previous film we see queenie and jacob's paths diverge quite emotionally and their storyline really stands out in this installment as well how was it to enter the third film on such a different stand-in and have to work through it with different character dynamics i mean you've always had each other haven't you in the, in the you take it and i will not question any part of it at all. <laughs> <laughs> um i think it, it it's it was sad honestly to to not be together because we started this journey out uh, you know, all of us as a little as a little group, and it was so wonderful. And then, uh, in the second film, we had barely any scenes together, and I was uh, I was sort of alone or with people that I didn't know. Um, and then, and in this film, you know, it's same. We, we didn't we didn't get a lot of time, so the time that we had was really precious. And um, you know, I think everybody wants these two characters to find their way back to each other um, because there's something. There's something there. There's something there that's really, that's really deep and true and good. And um, you know, that it's the the themes of love in this film are explored in different ways. Of love that is good for you, love that is maybe not so good for you. But how complex it is, even even when two people really love each other and they really it should just work. Sometimes it's just hard, you know. So finding our way to each other or not is it, it was um it was always it's always just better when we're together i think it's always more fun i agree wholeheartedly <laughs> <laughs> although i did have a great time with mads of course it did you know was as honest when but, I um, <laughs> you know it's uh, you're 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 just a tiny bit scarier than than right. jacob uh william did you also have a great time with mads with mads mm -hmm. mads mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, he tells me to say yes. <laughs> no, it was it was it was it was fantastic. Yeah, uh, Matt uh, is uh, is really a, a, people might perceive him as very impressive as a villain or whatever. I I I just see a fantastic actor, very very subtle, very um, uh, he he's basically an, uh, the ideal partner. And also, you know, I used to be a dancer before. I mean, it doesn't show now because uh, my body is stiff, but I used to be a dancer mm -hmm. before and I've done theater. And immediately I could feel that he was uh, a, a brother to me. And it was, it was immediate. He dances in between takes. That's the best bit. Did I? Yeah. Wonderful dancing. So he can't help it. That's a magical time. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was, was Eddie's so spell on spell. you. What was that spell? Eddie? Yeah, exactly. Eddie just oh, yeah, in the, the Toronto <laughs> <right, laughs> Allegra. <laughs> Well, do you know what? Thank you so much for taking the time to Thank speak you. to me and speak to everybody who is watching as well. Uh, Fantastic Beast: The Secrets of Dumbledore is out in theaters on April sixth. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.